Well, Happy New Year, Community Church. Yeah, hey, you're, you are more awake than the first service was. I got to tell you, I said, Happy New Year. And so, Happy New Year. So, hey, it's great to have you here today, and, and uh, it's so fun to see you all here. I know there's a lot of people traveling uh, during this time of year. I know we got family off early, early this morning, uh, heading back home, and so maybe you're here visiting. Uh, my name's Alan Cleveland. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to welcome you here and encourage you to stop by the visitor's desk outside the cafe um, after our service here. But, you know, for everyone, I, I do pray that as we uh, dive into this new year, it's, it's a promising to be a great one for you already. And so as we prepare to dig into God's Word, if you need a Bible this morning, just put your hand up and our ushers will get one to you. And... Uh, because we want you to engage with God's Word. We want you to interact with God's Word. And if you don't have a Bible and an easy-to-understand uh, translation, um, we encourage you to take this as our gift uh, to you uh, this morning. Now, as one church in several locations, throughout the year we have what we call uh, site-specific weeks, okay? I'm giving you a glimpse behind the scenes, some of the internal lingo that we use around here. And basically what a site-specific week means is that uh, there's not any particular series we're in, but uh, the pastor of a location has the opportunity to share from God's Word uh, what that particular body, that particular location needs to hear on that particular day. And so it's really simply a, a response uh, to a prayer, uh, and that would be, Lord, uh, what do you want this body to hear today? Well, what do you want us to engage with? What do you want us to interact with from your word? And so as I prayed that prayer, my heart was drawn back to our focus over this past year in which we've been going through Revelation, uh, you know, well, focusing in on verse 5 of chapter 21. We finished up the year looking at Revelation, an overview of that. But in 521, the Lord declares, behold, I'm making all things new. Right, that's the promise that we have to look forward to, that God is making all things new. And what a promise that is. And yes, in the context of Revelation, the John who's writing that letter is looking down the road a bit, but the fact is that God is doing new work in his people today, that he's doing a new work in your heart and my heart today, making us more into his people, that we can be that community of faith, bringing that faith uh, to the community. But what came back to the, what came to me as I was thinking about it, what bubbled up to the surface was the realization that even though we explored and celebrated the fact that God is making all things new, He's making His people new, He's making His church new, I still witness people caught up, getting caught up in that thing that they see in the rearview mirror, in that shadow that's cast by a decision they made five, ten years ago, maybe five days ago, maybe five hours ago. And, and, and it so overwhelms and it so overshadows that they can't see the future apart from. In effect, that whatever it was is defining who they are. And, and if we're going to be a people, a family who follow Jesus together, we also need to demonstrate what it means to be a people who walk in the freedom of forgiveness. That we understand what forgiveness means as it relates to us and then how we're to flesh that out in our relationships and contacts with the people around us. And so this morning we're going to be thinking about forgiveness a bit today and thinking about, first of all, that forgiveness releases. All right? Forgiveness releases. Now, I put on our tech team this morning, and I so appreciate them trying to make this work, uh, a little video clip that I want to show you of my granddaughter, okay? This is a proud grandpa time where uh, it happened just a few weeks ago at the mall. Uh, she's just learning how to walk, or she's been walking for a little bit, but just wanted to show you how, how competent she is at the moment here. So go ahead and play that. Hey! Hey! She's turned into a shopper. She cannot get enough of the mall and dragging her bag around. It is like cracking us up. Ivy, wait, goodbye. Say bye. 
I'm done shopping. <laughs> Isn't she cute? Yeah, all right. Boy, you know, you're so much more responsive than the first service. You know, they were like, it's like what do you mean? What are you saying about my granddaughter? But anyways, uh, you know, we celebrate these moments, right? When they start walking, you know, and it's like, yay, all right. You know, if only the events and the th things that they have to master and, and work through were as easy as, as learning how to walk, right? Because down the road, things get a little more complex. I mean, pretty soon, uh, you know, she'll have to learn how to, if she hurts somebody or offends somebody, she has to learn the ability to take ownership of what she did and, and maybe look at them and in the proper context say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. Or, or maybe what might be a little bit harder is, is that lesson of being able to look at somebody and say, you are forgiven. I, I'm, I'm not going to hold what you did against me. I'm, I'm going to release you from, from what you did and, and the impact on it. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to release it. Now, that gets increasingly harder because, you know, the, the impact gets all that much more significant, such that, well, I know it's hard to forgive. You know it's hard to forgive. I mean, I know because... Like, hey, my brother and I, I have a brother, he lives down in Dallas. Now, we haven't had an encounter like this in a long time. But, you know, when we were younger, you know, my, my parents would say, Paul, apologize to your brother, Alan. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. And then I'd haul off and go, you're forgiven. And I'd haul off and punch him just to make sure he knew how much I forgave him, right? No, there was a little sub-message there. I'm not really letting this go. I'm not going to release it. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, it's a hard thing to learn. It's a hard thing to practice. All life long. That's why it's all that much more astounding that when we dig into God's Word and we start in Genesis and we go all the way through Revelation, that we see the a description of her forgiveness unfolding through all the passages that, that reveal the fact that it's God who's taken the steps necessary in many cases and ultimately uh, even before we knew that we had to ask him to forgive us. You, you trace it through and you see it happening. You see it all the way through. I mean, we can take an example of like Psalm 103. And in Psalm 103, if you're feeling like, hey, i got to get my head on straight as we're coming into this new year, that's a fantastic passage. And what I'd encourage you to do by way of homework is take Psalm 103 and take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle and put God on one side and then me on the other. And then start writing descriptions because then you're going to be overwhelmed by the descriptions of God that are reflected by the psalmist in Psalm 103. It's overwhelming His grace and mercy such that in verses 11 and 12 we read this, uh, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. That, that God takes our transgressions and and he puts them uh, as far away, you know, we can't even think, can't even conceive of how far is the east is from the west. If you think about that for a moment, it's like, well, how, without drawing random lines on a map, how far is east from what? The point of the psalmist here is that God has so far separated us from our transgressions because of his grace and his mercy that he does not even bring them to mind. Oh, and we can read through all the way through God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. And, and, and forgiveness is not something that runs underneath the surface. It's, it's all the way, even beginning in, in the garden with Adam and Eve, and they're listening even to the, to the curse being pronounced on the serpent. And he says, you know, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And a small glimmer of the gospel hope that was injected into a hopeless situation 
back in Genesis. It, it unfolds and it, and it reveals, God reveals more and more and more until we find its culmination in the person of Jesus Christ. That, that birth that we celebrated last week, that first advent, Christ did not come to make for a nice nativity scene under a Christmas tree or at the mall or in the front yard. He came to demonstrate the grace and mercy of God and to, and to, to prove that God's forgiveness is, is extending out because he came to this place such that as Paul was reflecting on, on what Jesus did in Colossians chapter 3, or Colossians chapter 2, I'm sorry, he says this, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, in other words, you were, you were dead to God in your sin. You were far from it. You couldn't respond to God. You couldn't say, I'm sorry, because you were dead to him in terms of response. God made a lie together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That when we can stop to consider how God unfolded his plan and how it all came to focus in the person of Jesus Christ, what God did was take all those demands that were against us, all that debt, and put them on him. That when the nails were being driven, those nails were nailing our debt onto Christ on that cross. And in that is our hope because he paid the debt in full. There is not one part of any debt that we might have for God that Christ has not covered. There won't be a time when we stand before God and he says, okay, now what Jesus did on the cross covers all this, but you know, you see this portion here, Jesus didn't cover that part. You got you to gotta make up that part. No, what Jesus did on the cross paid the debt in full, cleared us, we're free. That is what Jesus did when he died on the cross for you and me. And in terms of forgiveness, God looks at us and says, it is released. The debt is gone. It is paid. You are free. Isn't that good news? That is awesome news. That is awesome news to hear that Christ paid the debt, and in Christ we experience a forgiveness that releases the debt against us, and so therefore forgiveness freeze. You know, and this is the heart of my heart today as we're coming into this new year because this is where I see so many people get caught, you know, that there's a point at which people say, hey, God's forgiveness is awesome. You know, what Jesus did on the cross is fantastic, but, but now, I need to, now I need to bring something to the table, right? And I got to work hard at it. I got to make up the difference. And, and the question is, well, what difference are you trying to make up? But we bring that to our minds. You know, we call it that fill-in-the-blank guilt. Some of us call it Catholic guilt. Some of us may call it Lutheran guilt. Some of us might call it Baptist guilt. Some of us might, it's just guilt, all right? We, we just hang on to it for some reason. And, and, and we feel like we need to add something to the good news. Well, Paul encountered this with churches that he was working with in this area called Galatia, and a number of churches in this part of what we call Turkey today, and he wrote a letter to them because he was very distressed. People had come into these churches, and they were saying, hey, this good news of Jesus is great stuff. It's awesome for you to hear about uh, Jesus, but there's a little more, you know? You got to do a little more. Is it? So it was kind of like Jesus plus Jesus and. You got to add something to what Jesus did. And, and it's almost like the connection between us and, uh, and, and God would become transactional. In other words, if I do this for God, he'll do this for me. And, and have you ever been in a bargaining war with God? Have you? You know, like, God, well, if you do this for me, I promise 
I'll go to church every Sunday in 2017. Uh, God, I've been watching TV, and I hear these guys on TV say that if I send them a dollar, you'll give me a hundred. If I if I if I take ten to church, will you give me a thousand? Uh, God, if I make this deal, and it's like what? What is this tit for tat? This you do this for me, I do this for you. Uh, yeah, no. At a, as a parent, there are times when we do that kind of that stuff, right? Hey, if you behave, I'll get you an ice cream cone. All right. Now that, that that's not a parenting tip for the week. You know, it's let that one go. Okay, but our basis, our relationship with our kids, uh, or you see, if a mother and a father with their children is not based or should not be based on some sort of, you do this for me, I'll do this for you. It's, it's a free expression of the love of the parents to the children. And it's a free expression of the love of God for his people. And Paul was so upset when he heard people saying, hey, you know, it's, it's great to hear about this you can have access to God through Jesus. Yeah, that's great. But to really get in good with God, then you have to also do these other things. You got to fill in this checklist. You got to make sure these little O's are filled in. You got to make sure you jump through these hoops, whatever. And Paul is saying, no. No. The reason why we have a relationship with God is because God was the one who took the initiative, God was the one who reached out to us. God who was the one who did the work. And in his grace, he calls us to respond to him. God is the one who's done it. And so when Paul was hearing people say, hey, no, it's, yeah, okay, God did some things, but you also have to do other things, Paul wrote to this church, and he says, if me or another angel comes to you with a message other than what we've already preached to you, let them be anathema. In other words, let them be damned. I mean, that, he's emphatic. He's upset because he sees these people losing their source of joy because all of a sudden it became about their performance and not what Jesus accomplished on the cross. He's that intense. And, and for him, it came down to this. I am free because of God's forgiveness towards me such that I identify myself in these terms. I don't count my life mine anymore. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who love, live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And because of that, he goes over in just a few pages or uh, just a page over, Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Don't submit again to that shadow that's being cast over you. Don't submit again to that, uh, to that event in the past that so defines what you're thinking about yourself that you can't see your future without it. If your, if your faith is in Christ, let your future be about Christ. Let your present be about Christ. Let Christ take care of your past, but let it be all about Jesus. Oh, that we would be a people who's so thoroughly immersed in the Word of God that we understand the freedom of our relationship with God and that we would not be defined by something we did yesterday or last week or this past year but that we would be defined by who we are in Jesus today, a forgiven people, a free people, a people who are responsive to his call because forgiveness releases the debt. God says you're forgiven, and forgiveness frees us. And that's why on January 1st, 2017, it is so appropriate that we have in our service time today uh, a communion. Uh, the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to ask our ushers to prepare to serve us here this morning, in which we take the bread and we take the cup, and yes, we remember a past event, what Christ accomplished on a cross years ago that's making a difference in people's lives today, in your life and in my life and our lives, and, 
And so we're called to remember what Jesus did for us. That in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in all that took place in those few days, what Jesus accomplished was that the debt was paid for you and for me.